Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luke Radford. Today, I'm going to be presenting a lecture recital titled Capturing the Divine, Religious Symbolism in the Piano Music of the Finnish composer Anna Giovanni Razavara. Before I get started, I'd like to say a few words of thanks to some people who um, helped this project to come together, um, have guided the different parameters of it, and um, been sources of encouragement throughout the way. Um, I'd like to thank my graduate advisor, Dr. Susan McClary, who's um, been a wealth of inspiration for uh, this project and helping me develop the ideas um, sufficiently. I'd also like to thank my teacher, Antonio Papavaldi, who's been a wellspring of inspiration um, as a pianist and a musician, both um, at CIM and outside of school. I'd also like to thank my wife, Christina, and my family, who some of which are here today, um, supporting me and being a constant source of encouragement for me during uh, my time at CIM. Thank you. <coughs> so what is this? What is the purpose of this whole presentation? Um, a few years ago, shortly after Razavar passed away in 2016, there was a, a brief spike in terms of his popularity, and um, I first came across a couple of his different piano pieces and was immediately struck by the freshness, um, unique uh, harmonic imaginations, his subtle use of rhythm, and his very strange and evocative titles for his pieces. Um, shortly thereafter, I had to get my hands on as many scores of his as I could, and to figure out how to play these pieces and making sense of them uh, in light of all of these strange things. One of the most important aspects um, in this project and in his music in general is how it intersects with how it intersects with you'll never know. <laughs> Just let, let me know if it cuts out again and we'll see if there's someone backstage. Okay. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of this project was how uh, his music intersects with uh, religious imagery and symbolism from all sorts of religious traditions and uh, all sorts of different sources. So a little bit about Rathavara. He was born in Helsinki in 1928 and after briefly studying abroad, um, at the recommendation of Jean Sibelius uh, at the Juilliard School. He studied with R Vincent Persichetti and Roger Sessions. Uh, he moved back to Helsinki and um, wrote in a secluded cabin uh, in the woods where he uh, remained in his native country till 2016. He is arguably Finland's most successful composer after Jean Sibelius, and you can clearly see that there was a, a passing of the baton from Sibelius to Rathavara. His nearly 60 year long career uh, took up most of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. And during this 60 year career, he composed no less than nine operas with his own original libretti, eight symphonies, 15 different concerti, and a vast array of chamber music and choral works, along with a whole slew of piano music. His earliest period begins in neoclassical and serialist styles uh, that he excelled in throughout the 1950s before changing to a neo-romantic and, and neo-impressionist approach throughout the 1970s um, up until uh, the 2000s. So with this presentation, I'm attempting to do two different things, one of which is to give a general exegesis of Rautavara's music, his harmonic language, how it connects with uh, symbolism and his his very subtle mind. And the other thing is I'd like to situate this in a greater context with uh, Christian art and religious art in general and symbolism and how uh, this music is able to increase our oral literacy, uh, how we might be able to understand the world around us, understand new music in more uh, deeper and deeper and more profound ways as we engage um, with, with the future of music in the 21st century. So Rautavara had a host of influences from a very wide range of sources. I had mentioned that he wrote his own opera libretti, but he didn't stop there. He wrote prolifically short stories. He was an avid painter. Um, he wrote lots of different poems, 
uh, and he even had a couple of different uh, books in the works. And so he was he drew on a, a very wide range of influences. Among the two most significant composers who contributed to his musical life and understanding were Paul Hindemith and Olivier Messiaen, whose use of symmetrical scales, uh, non-functional, non-traditional harmonic writing and rhythms, along with their use of um, very evocative titles and uh, deep spirituality had a very big influence on his music, particularly Messiaen's use of his modes of limited transposition, um, his evocations of birds and angels that became a very big preoccupation for Rosalora. Two other figures are the uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung, uh, whose work um, brought the inner world in the first part of the 20th century uh, into focus and kind of exploded the inner life of the individual and of the artist. And this is something that preoccupied a lot of Rosalora's thinking. And finally, there's Rainer Maria Rilke, the existentialist German poet, who uh, Rothbard famously put um, Rilke's Duino elegies to music. And these are a collection of poems that have an intensely mystical atmosphere to them, weighing beauty and existential suffering together. Indeed, Rothbard's work is, en masse, situated in a kind of ontological torment between the limitations and the insufficiency of the human condition and the fractured consciousness of the modern age. Man's loneliness, life and death, love and the duty of the artist are at the forefront in a lot of his music. So we face this massive shift in language in the 20th century that continues to this day. And one of the problems that most people face is how do we understand modern music? Every composer has his or her own unique grammar their own unique way of writing and understanding the world. So we have this multiplicity of languages that everyone is speaking, and it's hard to decipher and understand all of them, especially because they're inspired by so many different sources. So in many ways, music is now able to express the minutia and the various pathologies of modern life, but it also runs the risk of being understood by fewer and fewer people en masse, whereas uh, throughout history, going back through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, they were very easy calling cards to recognize in art and music as explaining very specific things. So what does Rothbard do about this? He engages in something that we call the semiosphere. The semiosphere, uh, sometimes we, we talk about semiotics or the, the study of signs and symbols. So the great semiotician Charles Price defined the semiosphere in the following way. He says, through the production of individual texts, a culture creates an always incomplete and ever-changing model of itself. The total combination of all such texts at a given time is the semiosphere. In this case, much of Western civilization, we can say, is built on the works of the ancient Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, the Bible, the works of Dante and Shakespeare. All of these texts uh, we find um, in the films that we watch, in all of the music and the, uh, the, uh, the writings, there are all these references to these constantly. We can't get away from it. And so Rothbard reaches back into this great uh, historical, musical, literary tradition, drawing on a lot of these different themes and ideas and redressing them in his own particular uh, fresh and unique musical vocabulary. One of the most important ways he does this and it's something that we won't be able to get away from whenever we're thinking about Rothbard's music, whenever we're talking about it, is this term, ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is an ancient Greek rhetorical exercise in which uh, the master would um, prompt a student to <coughs> compose either a work of music or poetry based, say, on a piece of visual art or a sculpture. So there was this exercise and this need to understand the essence of a work of art and being able to replicate that in different media. It wasn't enough for something to be chained to its physical form. And music, given that it's fundamentally abstract, we can't hold it, you know, we can't, we don't hear anything when we lift our ears to the page, right? It's, it's fundamentally, we're, we're manipulating sound. So this creates a very wide possibility for us to, to express all of these different things through something that's inherently intangible. 
So ekphrasis, again, is this transposition of a work of art into another. The first big attempt at this ekphrastic musical transposition comes in 1955 with Rathavar's first large piano suite titled Icons. What are icons? According to, to tradition, it was the evangelist St. Luke, who was a painter as well as a physician, who created the first icon by painting a portrait of Mary, the mother of God. And it was she who remained the most frequent subject of later icons, along with scenes from the Gospels and portraits of both male and female saints. From century to century, millennium to millennium, the subjects and styles of iconic paintings have remained unchanged. It's a static art, timeless, immobile, and Asiatic. The artists, too, remain for the most part unnamed and anonymous, save for relatively few. So such is the nature and the mystery of the theme, which is divinity itself. You walk into an Orthodox church or a cathedral, and you're going to be bombarded by blues, pinks, yellows, whites, and countless different faces written in all sorts of different languages. The mystery of the theme, divinity itself, is such that its mere interpreter, the flesh, the composer, the musician, chained as it is to time and mortality, is reduced to insignificance. So like I said, this suite, Icons, made up of six works. The first is titled The Dormition of the Theotokos. Sometimes it's also called The Death of the Mother of God. This is a pretty famous icon. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the musical setting of this piece is a funeral march. You can see that the Mother of God lies down on a purple bed. She's illuminated and surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, among them disciples and apostles. These are not ordinary lowly fishermen anymore. They're now priests, bishops, deacons, and doctors of the church. This icon is also flanked by two large church towers where there would be bells ringing during this funeral procession. There's something quite dynamic about this. There's something also still almost, it, it's, it's frozen in amber. And we get in the center of this icon, Christ himself descending from heaven. And in his hands, he's holding this tiny creature. What is that? That little creature that's, that's illuminated represents the soul of his mother that he's escorting back up into heaven. So there's this contrast of lifting up and also this kind of funeral march dirge like pushing down. So there are these two conflicting forces here. And you'll hear this clanging of bells and uh, the funeral march that actually ends up occurring uh, in all of the different icons in this set. The second icon Two village saints. This icon would have been painted on the door of an iconostasis or the old icon cabinet. You might find it in some village church where these two saints are in dialogue, looking down over a village, chatting back and forth, making jokes. And uh, indeed, the upper voice is very much like a folk song, while the, the lower voice parries it a little bit and the hands switch, and then the, the other monk responds on this folk song. Um, sooner or later, it opens up to this grand vista where these two monks see the village with the church bells again, and then you'll, get, you'll hear the um, bell-like motifs return briefly from the first icon before the folk song picks up again and the two monks scurry off. It's just in two voices. The third icon is called the Black Madonna of Blakarnaya. So in this icon, we return to Byzantium once again, into the Blakarnaya church in Constantinople. Blackened by candle smoke and scarred by centuries of human history, the Black Madonna of Blakarnaya stretches out her hands. In her bosom, the Christ child is seen like a round medallion, gesturing upward and off into the distance, while her hand is held out and her dark eyes stare directly at you. You might be able to also see her tears, which are actually painted red. They might be tears of blood. 
She looks like some late classical priestess, and in these eyes there's no gleam of mercy or tenderness. These eyes have seen too much, and they gaze very steadfastly from their dark background. They've seen too much of man and his suffering. So this is a decidedly different take on the Madonna and the child, and the musical setting of this piece is quite static and situated like a call and response, where she is gesturing and speaking to her son, and he responds in a similar fashion. The fourth icon is the baptism of Christ. Here I have an icon and a very famous Renaissance painting of the, the same setting. The icon is painted in bluish green, red, and gold. And you can see that the river flows straight down from the background, but it combs out almost like a lock of hair. And you can see that the river in both in both of these pictures, but it's it's much more prominent in, in the icon. And the, the musical setting of this actually begins from the background of the icon, where you're in the river flowing down through to the foreground. Christ is flanked on both sides, on one by his cousin John the Baptist, who is baptizing him and anointing him, and on the other side by angels who are holding linens to dry him off, and they're bowing in stiff reverence toward him. At the top of both pictures, you can see the hands of God opening up out of heaven, just off, uh, just outside of the border. And descending down from heaven is the dove, the personification of the Holy Spirit, where God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so the realization, remember at Crisis, you're, you're repainting the picture in the music, but you're also getting involved into the psychology of, of the characters of these people. So you're flowing along the river and all of a sudden it opens up into the realization that this is a divine man. This is the Son of God as he comes out of the water. And you can almost hear word for word the words coming out of heaven before uh, the river keeps flowing. The fifth icon is the holy women at the sepulcher. This is sometimes also referred to as the, the, the myrrh-bearing women, the holy myrrh-bearers. These are the women who ventured to Christ's tomb, bearing frankincense and myrrh to anoint his body. And to their horror, they see that the stone has been rolled away and that the tomb is empty. And see, next to the tomb, you can see this large angel who sits in uh, a bit bewilderment and also amusement at their surprise who comments, he's not here, he's risen. And so the musical setting of this icon is very much like um, overhearing quiet personal prayers whispered from the lips of these women. And it soon opens up into their surprise that you can hear and ultimately consolation at the words that they hear from the angel. The sixth and final icon of this set is the Archangel Michael fighting Satan. On face and calm in spite of all of his speed, the Archangel Michael rides his winged red horse over the ugly body of Satan, often personified as a, as a dragon or a winged serpent, some kind of monster. He seems at first sight to have rather too many tasks going on. You can see in one hand he holds a spear, and another he has a censer. He's also holding a book and blowing a trumpet from his lips, all while riding a horse. And his expression is rather calm and placid. His youthful features bear such a peaceful expression that even the violent movement of the scene is constrained into a powerful and dynamic stillness. And so Ralph Guevara sets this icon, again, in two voices, really more like two textures, where the right hand is playing a perpetual motion toccata in 16 notes, and the lower voice is hammered out all of these sharp quarter notes. And as the two characters in this icon intermingle and get closer to one another, the violence becomes more charged. And you'll hear, I'll demonstrate briefly, uh, three hammer blows from Satan himself. And they're rendered thus.
I'm going to leave this up here and play the whole suite now, and you can track each of these icons, how they're transmuted through music.
those were the icons. Next, we're jumping forward about 15 years to the late 60s. Between 1969 and 1970, Rathavar wrote his two piano sonatas. These are the only two works in this genre that he ever wrote, ever attempted. One wonders why. Uh, it's important to note that they're actually given titles as opposed to called piano sonata. So there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg problem. The first sonata is titled Christus und die Fischer, in German, Christ and the Fisherman. It's based on a painting by the same name from the 19th century German painter Ernst Zimmermann. However, Rathbar claims that the sonata is fundamentally an abstract work and not a representation of the painting itself. Rathbar says this, My attitude was at that time anti-clerical, but a strong, devout, and archaic feeling radiated from the picture. The feeling of the sea and of those faces was the same, timeless, formless, the idea itself just an abstract question. Nothing more, no plot, no story, no proclamation, but there came from the picture this strong sense of its identity. So this practice of giving an abstract piece of music a seemingly programmatic title would become one of the key characteristics in Rathenwar's music. There's a bit of a paradox. You're giving a very specific name to something, but you're claiming that it's not that thing. So this is where we come into it and have to start interpreting it. He had, on multiple occasions, stated that the titles of his pieces exist as attributes to the original sources of the inspiration and the character of the music in question. So this is the painting, Christus Lindy Fischer, not of any one particular biblical scene, but just a general collection of them. You can see in the background, there's possibly the Sea of Galilee. You see ropes, the edge of the boat, and a few of his disciples leaning in as Christ is talking to them. So let's look at some of the features of this sonata. It's in three movements, which is not so different from the norm. But what's unique about these is that they're, each of the sub-movements are marked ataka, or one flows right into the next. And it's precisely inverse from what we would typically expect from a, a sonata form, in that the book-ending movements, the first and the third movements, are slow, while the second is fast. It features quite a bit of palindromic rhythms. So these are rhythms that can be read frontwards and backwards. He frequently uses time signatures like 13-8 or 8-8, eight, eight. and so you'll have these small cells of 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, giving this almost hypnotic and, and winding loop. The last movement is a fugato, and it evokes uh, a Bach chorale, something that you might have heard 200 years prior. It has all of the right entrances and cadences, but it could not be more different harmonically. Further, there are also these cluster cadences that took me a while to figure out you know, why, why was he ending each of these movements with clusters. Well, I, I realized that actually the boundaries of these clusters ended up having fifth relationships to them. So it's almost like a, a, a redressed, authentic cadence, book ending each movement, where after all of the harmonic and rhythmic ventures, we suddenly get a big 5-1 out of nowhere. And he often will indicate these clusters and cluster cadences as there's an initial attack and then tonality is revealed out of it. And I take this to mean, as, again, going back to the, the idea of the, the semiosphere, there's this wide variety of texts. There's a multiplicity. And you take all of them in, and it gives you a singularity. So both of them exist at the same time. Out of these violin clusters, there's still tonality. He's hanging on to something. There's also an interesting numerological component in this sonata, particularly revolving around the numbers three and five. Three obviously being the number of completion in, in most cultures and in the Christian tradition. It has to do with the Trinity, the three persons of, of the Godhead. And so we can think about triads as having a very rich history in the church and in different um, expressions of the faith as well as these, these very tight nodes that express uh, divinity, fullness, and completion. But Rathbar twists this a little bit with the number five, which in most cultures represents man himself, human beings. So we have a head, two hands, and two legs, just like a star. And so he uses these threes and these fives 
creating these quintal triads. So three note chords, but they're each, each of the notes in the chords are separated by fifth. And these chords move, they often plane in and out of each other. They don't have any strict harmonic function. But there's an interesting kind of multidimensionality to it where if you think about it a little bit, it's called Christus and the Fischer, and you begin with all of these quintal triads. I take that to mean it's, it's actually Christ himself who is the triad because he's fully God, as in he's a triad, there's three, but he's also fully man because each of those three notes are separated by fifth. So this multidimensionality we see right at the very opening where the top voice, those quintal triads, gradually plane down, each of them are syncopated, we have hardly have any downbeats. And in the lower voice, we have ascending fifths that are constantly reaching up. And what happens is gradually over time, these two elements phase in and out of each other. And as these voices phase through one another, they create this cross that happens. If you could almost abstract, uh, take, take an abstract grid of this piece, you can see that at the points that they touch, then they often will change direction, waiting to cross again. And so this, this is a clear reference to someone like Bach, who in so many of his fugues would illustrate through the voices and through careful counterpoint these different crosses that happen. This sonata is also self-referential in that in each of these three movements, it reuses material and redevelops it from before. Rautavara often called himself um, a midwife rather than a composer. He wasn't this composer who was struggling to, to give birth to pieces, rather he was kind of sidestepping music and letting the piece, ushering the piece out in whatever form that it would be. He also believed that he only ever really wrote one piece and it existed as a kind of platonic form that he was always coming back to and rewriting and re-editing again and again and again. And each of those attempts are iterations of the same piece. And so in this one you might you will surely hear uh, all of these different themes that are being reused, particularly the quintal triads and a lot of these voice crossings. So here we can take a look at a few score examples from uh, all three movements. Notice just the difference in texture. The top image is from the middle of the first movement, so we have these quintal triads again, but they're not syncopated here. They're blocked. And below we have these rippling arpeggios that move up and down. They're not, the, the, these voices aren't crossing this time, but you can imagine it's almost as if these triads are on top of the waves. It's as if Christ himself is actually walking on the water. In the second image, it's the beginning of the second movement, we have more of these palindromic rhythms. It starts in 13-8, have these different cells with the way he stems them. Three plus two plus three plus two plus three. There are also oscillations from black to white keys. So he'll have clusters on the white keys that move to clusters on the black keys. But there are very few repetitions on the same color of the key. So there's, he's really using all of the materials that he can um, and illustrating it very graphically. And the third movement, you can see at the bottom, the bottom image, begins over this pedal to B-flat, again acting as some sort of macro five, this kind of suspension. There's a sense that the harmony never quite resolves. It's floating over this B-flat pedal. And these are the chords that begin the fugato subject. Here we have two more icons. Christ and the disciples that might serve as some kind of uh, reference narrative element. On the left, we have um, Christ telling the fishermen to throw their nets over onto the other side of the boat after they've had a, a dry spell and they catch all of the fish. And on the right is where Christ is calming the storm after he's woken up by the disciples. And they say, who is this that even he, even the, the winds and the waves should obey him? And so though Rautavara negated any attempt at a close narrative reading, 
one can't help but wonder that he was clearly aware of all of these things and um, maybe threads of these scenes pop up in the sonata itself. I'm going to play Christus in the Fisher.
one year later, Baltivar writes the second piano sonata that he titles The Fire Sermon in 1970. This sonata draws on Buddhist sources and possibly a reference from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Uh, he, again, sidesteps any clear reference of what the fire sermon means, where he got it, but there are two possible things that it might allude to. On the left, you can see uh, an old woodcut of the Buddha delivering the fire sermon, which in essence is about uh, burning away, the burning away of attachments and of the passions. Fire has kind of a dual purpose, symbolically. It can destroy and eat, but it can also purify and refine. And so through this winnowing process from the fire sermon, um, your attachments, your, your pains, all of these things are burned away, but as a result, you're purified. On the right is the blind prophet Tiresias, who appears uh, in the beginning of T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, as kind of declaring the end of all things, the, so the sorry state of man uh, who is afflicted by all of these passions and has grown uh, alien in his own world, has grown blind. So this sonata treads the path mapped out by Rathavar's earlier piano suites, especially the first sonata. I said before that they were twins in some way, but the second sonata is everything that the first is not. It also is in three movements, or three kind of nested movements, but this time the bookending movements are much faster, and there's a central, slower movement. There's also the fire versus water aspect of it. I mean, you can't get more elementally opposite than that. And the features in this sonata are also uh, quite unique and similar to the first in that there are a lot of self-referential ideas. This image that you see is actually the start of the second sonata, and again we have these palindrome rhythms. This time he writes it in 8-8, eight, eight, or you know, there are eight beats per measure, and each eighth note gets one of those beats. It almost looks like a, an infinity symbol, or a snake eating itself, and so there's this, there's this uh, interesting visual component going on where we've got these three plus two plus three going on. In the left hand, I'm playing A natural and G natural, so a lot of the right hand notes are on the white keys while, uh, I'm sorry, the left hand notes are playing the white keys and the right hand notes are often playing on the black keys. So there are, again, these, this, he's playing with the materials of the keyboard itself. Lots of mirror images. Um, where voices will move in parallel or contrary motion to each other, along with quite a bit of harmonic symmetry, so this would be extensive uses of octatonic scales and any sorts of harmonies and scales that can be evenly divided and um, in many cases stacked on top of one another. So here we have some different excerpts that are pretty illustrative of, of these points. In the top left, you can see this, these mirrored images of the outer voices moving uh, in proportion to one another, outward and inward, while we keep the rhythmic palindromes in the middle voice of these three plus two plus three. Right below that, we have more planing chords that we heard from before in the first sonata, and this time, these huge arpeggios are sweeping up and down. Rathbar often writes the emotional gesture very clearly, with very bold colors. Below that, we have the start of the third movement, which, similar to the first, is also a kind of fugue, but it's completely different. Rather than a Bach chorale, this is much more percussive and violent. And we have these different um, exchanges between voices and compositional techniques over the next couple of images, retaining um, mirror, uh, mirrored images, symmetrical writing, and um, contrasting black and white keys. At the top, the top right image, that's the beginning of the second movement, and we've got these two different harmonic and um, rhythmic cells going on with these uh, eighth notes contrasted with um, eighth note triplets. Below that, we have more, more um, harmonic and uh, rhythmic contrasts going on 
quarter notes juxtaposed with sixteenths. Below that, we have another massive octatonic scale with his signature triads moving by step. And so this, this sonata is completely ecstatic. The first movement begins in a very fast tempo, giving rise to these gigantic moving fields of clusters. It achieves a static state, and over it appears a very delicate cantabile section that occurs again in the third movement. The second movement is a quasi-rondo, and it has a rather fragmentary structure to it before giving way to these gigantic uh, arpeggios and, again, more clusters with the forearms. And what's interesting about the ending of the sonata is that it doesn't contain any of the dying out characteristics of Rathamara that we heard, um, say, in the, in the first sonata, unless we count this strange echo effect at the final triple forte chord. This time, death is dramatic. And so the final cluster, out of that, again, the multiplicity and the singularity, there's this big D major chord that rings out. For me, that, that always reminds me of something like a Picardy third from music written much before that, where there's this suspense of how is it going to resolve, and the wholeness is there at the end in this D major chord. So the performance of this piece, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult work, but it also enacts this kind of ritual of the, of the fire burning away everything. Before I play it, this is another picture of, of the fire sermon. Before I play this piece, I'd like to just read um, a translation of, uh, of the fire sermon, just a, a brief portion of it. All things, O priests, are on fire. And what, O priests, are all these things which are on fire? The I, O priests, is on fire. Forms are on fire. I, consciousness, is on fire. Impressions received by the I are on fire. And whatever sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, or indifferent, originates in dependence on impressions received by the I, that also is on fire. And with what are these on fire? With the fire of passion, say I, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of infatuation, with birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, misery, grief, and despair are they on fire. This is the fire sermon.
For the four, fourth work I'm playing today is called Narcissus. This is from 2001, at the beginning of Rothbard's late period. Um, during this time, he wrote only four works for the piano. This is the first of that group of four, again, called Narcissus. Rothbard, at this point, enters his final stage, his final form, where everything, uh, again, over these 50, 60 years, has been taken to its apex. This piece is in a very taut, very uh, constrained and tightly composed musical form that's um, almost like a sonata in its own right, although it's probably more like a five-part rondo in another sense. About this work, he says this, Narcissus was composed as a set piece for the International Violin Piano Competition in Helsinki for 2002. But also, it was an outcome of my love for symmetry. Symmetrical scales, inversions of melodies, and mirror harmonies have in fact always been typical of my music, ever since I wrote the three symmetrical preludes while still a student at the Sibelius Academy in the 1940s. Narcissus does not really describe anything, but it turned out to be so much a mirror game with virtuosic motifs that the only correct name for it was Narcissus. So we can see him here, uh, gazing into the pool, falling in love with his own reflection, and he would remain there until he wasted away and died. It might be worth recounting the story of Narcissus rather briefly. His mother, Liriope, took him when he was 15 to ask a question of Theresius, the blind prophet from the fire storm. She went to him asking if he would have long life, and he would grow to be an old man. And this prophet had second sight. His predictions made his name renowned throughout all of ancient Greece. And he said this to Lariope. He says, only if he fails to recognize himself will he achieve long life. So neither Lariope nor anyone else, including Narcissus, understood this answer at the time. Only if he fails to recognize himself will he achieve long life and die as an old man. And what's interesting is that it depends on what you mean by recognize yourself. Right? He did see his reflection, but it's if he fails to recognize himself with the old. So he did see some aspect of himself, but he fell in love just with the appearance of it. And so this work reflects many of these interesting features. Like I said, it has a very strict formal layout it's hardly even a hundred measures long. It's filled with all sorts of symmetrical scales, chords, inversions. It's almost turning a piece inside out and examining it from all sorts of angles. And again, we have more mirror and imitation games. You're actually looking at the, the very beginning of the piece, which begins again with another pedal, E flat. And there are these quiet splashes in the water that grow and become more and more intense, evocative, and ultimately seductive for Narcissus as he becomes totally entranced with this reflection. Here's some more images from the score. And you can see many of these same sorts of winding lines with all of these very fast, very light, and soft scales that really are a path to nowhere. They might represent the pool that he's looking into and the streams of water. They might also represent his winding and uh, aimless psyche as he becomes totally entranced with himself. The large middle section that you'll hear actually gets more and more dense. Rathavara casts it in three staves and ends up becoming more and more rife with voices and entrances that again, don't really resolve anywhere or do much. There's sort of this plethora of things to look at and pay attention to, just like in a reflection, but they're ultimately meaningless and they don't lead anywhere. We have some of the other mirror games, as you can see, where a lot of the other voices will push outwards or become convex. On the left side of the bottom image, you can see again this central voice which acts as kind of a split point, as a through line for most of the piece that starts with that B flat and becomes more and more active. And if we think about the painting, again, remember, there's the upper portion of the subject of Narcissus bending down, and then there's the pool itself, 
and then there's the reflection underneath in the composition of the painting. So that axis of where everything is reflected takes place on this central stage that, again, sort of wraps around itself. And all of these different entrances that happen in the right hand is staggered in the left hand. And at the end of the piece, ultimately, that stream comes upward, and the reflection and the subject, Narcissus and his reflection, become almost the same. The lower voice passes through the upper voice, again, coming back to the spacing and how these characters are actually moving through one another. And what that might mean in terms of the meaning of the piece, where it becomes difficult to determine who is who. Right? You get lost in your own like you get lost in your own ego. So yeah, these images show these lines of division and mirror. He often writes not in any particular tonal center, but he operates around different, say, tonal shapes. So the keyboard is divided into two halves, really. There are two different split points. One of them is on D, and the other is on G sharp or A flat. And so if you follow intervallically the outworkings from both D or A flat, you'll get proportional uh, intervals. And so Rathbar plays with these different center points and will often, like I said, keep the, that axis, that line of division, wrapping around those notes um, while the others are mirroring one another. And literally, the hands will mirror themselves along with the music. by Narcissus.
presentation, I said that I set out to do two things, first of which is to give exegesis, an overview, and an analysis of Ron Tavar's uh, piano music, particularly his uh, harmonic language and surveying works over his 60-year career. And the other plan was to see how his style of writing and his influence intersected with a very, very great and wide and deep tradition of religious symbolism and uh, engaging in the semiosphere and translating all of these different works of visual art and the stories that we tell ourselves as a culture and drastically translating that into music that's fresh, that's original, and that hopefully piques our interest and helps us to engage and listen to music in a new way with all of our senses, not just our ears, um, and get us to remember who we are as people, as a culture, and a civilization uh, in the 21st century.